Even what the enemy means for evil, you turn it for our good. You turn it for our good and for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You are working for our good. You are working for our good and for your glory. Even what the enemy means for evil, you turn it for our good. You turn it for our good for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You are working for our good. You are working for our good and for your glory. Your plans are still to prosper. We have not forgotten us. Us in the fire and the blood, you faithful forever, perfect in love. You are so great over us. Well, good morning again, everyone, and uh, welcome to another service of worship. And if you are visiting with us in any way, you are very welcome to be joining us online today for our service, and uh, we pray God will, will bless richly as we meet together at home and yet in spirit before God. By way of uh, a notices, announcements, not so much really to mention this morning, but I, I do need to encourage you to register for services next Sunday. Hopefully, this will be our last Sunday uh, doing the online um, Hopefully it will be the last one. We're not sure what the new year will bring, but God willing, uh, things will, will go forward. And can I just remind you that you do need to book for next Sunday's services, and that the online booking is open from Monday, and the office is open on Tuesday from 2 o'clock to 4 if you want to uh, ring in and book there. It is important that you do this. Uh, we can uh, only facilitate up to 70 people within the hall for each given service, and so it's important that you do register and let us know that you are uh, desiring to come. We will have uh, the time of prayer again on Wednesday night, which is on Zoom once more, and uh, if you can uh, join in, that would be lovely that you do so, and uh, the details for joining are uh, posted on Facebook on Wednesday evening, and uh, all being well, that will run as smoothly as possible. Uh, those are, are the notices, and uh, God willing, we will be able to meet together uh, in the, the service next Sunday at 10 o'clock, and then again at 12 o'clock. As we come to worship God, we want to hear words that are in the book of Joel, the prophet Joel in chapter 2 and verse 21 says, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication he has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain as before. Today we're staying with Elijah as we come after Mount Carmel to the, those moments when the rain came again. And it's described as rain in abundance. And uh, we couldn't leave off Elijah at, a, at such a, an important point. And so we want to consider that uh, end of, passage, of chapter 18, where the Lord sends the rain. Our opening praise today is, is a, a lovely hymn entitled, The Ancient of Days. And it is a hymn that, again, just reminds us how great God is and how He does reign over all things, as He has done from the beginning of time and will continue to do so. The Ancient of Days.
going to pray together. O Lord God, our Father in heaven, we come into your presence to worship you. We bow before the one who is the triune God, the mighty one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Lord, the words of the hymn remind us that you are the one who has been from everlasting, the Ancient of Days. You rule over all things. You know us as you watch over us. And we thank you, our Father in heaven, that in your majesty 
you have prepared all things for us. You do send rain upon the earth in its season, and you bring the, the sunshine to strengthen the crops and to gather in and to brighten up our days. And we thank you for those daily blessings and provisions. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, that when our Savior Jesus ascended into heaven, he promised the Holy Spirit to come down. And on that great day of Pentecost, we remember how the Holy Spirit came down as in tongues of fire upon the people gathered in Jerusalem, the believers there in the upper room. And it is by your Holy Spirit that we are drawn into your family and into your communion, and that in humility we come to the throne of grace to worship our God and our Redeemer. In your word, O Lord, you show us your greatness, your power, and your glory. In your word, you speak of your love for all that you have made. And you show us love in sending your only Son into this world. By your word and by your Spirit, you enable hearts to believe in the Lord Jesus as the only Redeemer and way of salvation. You teach us to believe in the one whom you have sent, that in running to him, we might find refuge and shelter from the stormy seas of life. We might find forgiveness from our sins, that we might shelter in his love. Lord, forgive us from our sins, deliver us from evil, and draw us closer to your side as we meet to get to worship you. Let your name be exalted in this world today. Lord, we pray that people everywhere will be humbled by the sense of our inability to help ourselves and to realize that only by looking to a sovereign God can we truly find answers, healing, and deliverance. So, Lord, as you meet with us and as we meet with you, fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit that drawing near to you, we will worship you in spirit and in truth. For your name's sake. Amen. Our Bible reading this morning is 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 41 to 46. And Caris is going to read these verses for us. 1 Kings 18, verse 41. Then Elijah said to Ahab, now go eat and drink, because a heavy ruin is coming. So King Ahab went to eat and drink. At the same time, Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, where he bent down to the ground with his head between his knees. Then Elijah said to his servant, Go and look towards the sea. The servant went and looked. I see nothing, he said. Elijah told him to go and look again. This happened seven times. The seventh time, the servant said, I can see a small cloud, the size of a human fist coming from the sea. Elijah told the servant, Go to Ahab and tell him to get his chariot ready and go home now, otherwise the rain will stop him. After a short time, the sky was covered with dark clouds. The winds began to blow, and soon I started back to Jezreel. The Lord gave, us, gave his part to Elijah who tightened his clothes around him and ran ahead of King Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Amen. The Lord will bless the reading of his word unto our hearts. And we thank you, Caris, for reading that passage for us today. The children's video talk today is uh, by Mark. Hi, everybody. Well, it's December, Christmas is coming. I'm guessing that loads of you have already got your Christmas trees up and your baubles and your fairy lights and I bet your houses are just looking lovely. I get excited about Christmas. I'm especially excited about Christmas this year because this year has just been a bit funny. At Christmas time, there's one gift that I love to get. I always hope to find Lego underneath the Christmas tree. These are some of my 
favourite pieces of Lego. We've got rockets and lunar modules and astronauts. These pieces of Lego tell the story of when people travelled to the moon and when they walked on the moon. I want to tell you part of that story today and then I'll explain to you why it can teach us an important lesson as we approach Christmas. So I'm going to tell you this story really quickly using my Lego toys. This is the Saturn V rocket. It was absolutely huge. It was actually 111 meters tall, which is enormous. And it had so much fuel because it needed to have so much power in those boosters. Enormous it was. It actually, it was about 60 Ivor Hutchinson standing on top of each other. That's how tall the Saturn V rocket was. And this is the Eagle, the lunar lander. Uh, and this is the little spidery looking spacecraft that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin had to fly down onto the moon. There they are inside. Look, there's Neil and Buzz looking a wee bit jaundiced just in there uh, at the moment. But, um, and this is the lunar lander. This is what it actually looked like. It was an amazing ship. So whenever they landed on the moon, they had to come down the ladder very carefully and then they stepped foot onto the surface of the moon. And it must have been absolutely amazing. Whenever they walked, they kind of floated a little bit as well and they were able to do these great big jumps. Um, and when they were on the moon, they put the American flag in there and then they went for an explore around to see what tricks they could do whenever they were walking around the moon. So here they are. This is Neil Armstrong and Michael Collins and Buzz Aldrin. Michael Collins didn't get to walk on the moon. He had to keep flying around. But Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were the first people ever to walk on the moon. Many, many people still believe that that was one of the most important days in history back in 1969 when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. But I want to introduce you to another astronaut who thought about things in a very different way. His name was James Irwin, and he was a Christian, and he flew on Apollo 15. And this is James Irwin. This guy is an absolute legend. He flew the lunar module. He actually landed on the moon on Apollo 15. James Irwin was a Christian. He loved God with all of his heart. And every time he traveled into space and looked around, he explained how it just reminded him how amazing and great God must be. When he looked at the world, he actually said that it reminded him of a bauble hanging on a Christmas tree. James Irwin was the eighth person to walk on the surface of the moon. But there was something different about James Irwin. He did not think that the most important thing in history was people walking on the moon. James Irwin knew that the most important thing in history was something else altogether. It was about God coming down to our earth and walking with us. James Irwin famously said that God walking on the earth is more important than man walking on the moon. When James Irwin was in space and he looked up into the starry sky, it reminded him of the star that guided the wise men to see the Lord Jesus in the manger. When he was walking on the moon, it made him think about Jesus walking on earth with us, showing us how to love, showing us how to live a life that's full. And when James Irwin thought about the flag that they put onto the surface of the moon. It made him think about the cross that they raised on top of that hill in Calvary, where they crucified Jesus. People are still trying to explore space. In fact, in America, there's people who have a plan to, to try and get all the way to Mars. That would be amazing, it would be really exciting. But there's one place that they will never be able to travel to in a rocket. Astronauts, whenever they've gone out into space, have sometimes looked around to see if they could see heaven, and they've never been able to see it. But that's because heaven's a place that we can't see with our own eyes. We will never be able to travel to heaven in a rocket or a spaceship. 
We also will never ever be able to get our own way to heaven just by doing good things. See, we can't get our own way to heaven. And because we can't get up to God, God, who loved us so much, sent his son Jesus down to us to rescue us. So we should never think that we can work our way up to God. He came down to us. James Irwin was absolutely right. Jesus walking on the earth is far more important than man walking on the moon. I want you to remember that this Christmas. Remember that Jesus Christ coming to earth is all about God wanting to be close to us, to rescue us, to bring us to himself so that we can be with him forever. Don't forget that this Christmas. I'm going to share another hymn of praise. It's an older hymn, but a lovely hymn that reminds us of how much we need the breath of God, the Holy Spirit, to fill our hearts and inspire us and revive us. O breath of life. And we uh, unite in singing these lovely words. take a moment or two just to bow in prayer and to just pray for people in our congregation and for the needs of our nation. During this past week, we have to report the uh, death of Miss Mary McLaughlin, and we want to commend her brothers Stuart and Alec to God in prayer and other members of the family. There are other, mem other families that we also would uh, remember in sorrow, especially as we approach Christmas time. Let's pray together. Father, we know that we do depend upon your Holy Spirit to breathe life into us. We know, Lord, it is by your power that we have the breath of life by which we live. As your servant Job said, the Lord gave, the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And so, Lord, we acknowledge that the life that we have is given by you, and it is yours to take away. Today, O oh God, we 
remember the McLaughlin family in sorrow. We know that uh, it was a close family of Mary with her brothers, Stuart and Alec. And we just want to pray that you will be with the brothers as they mourn the loss of their, of their second sister. We pray for other members of the wider family circle too. And Lord, at this time as we come into the Christmas season, we know that there are those in our congregation and, and around our district who have been through this valley of, of sorrow and for whom Christmas will be a, a different season this time around. We pray your comfort with them and your blessing upon them. Lord, we thank you for those who have been in hospital and are now at home, and we pray for their continuing res restoration of health and strength. We realize that there are also some in hospital, and we pray that you will be with them there and with the medical care that they receive from doctors and nurses. We remember those who have the COVID infection, and we pray for their well-being, whether it's in hospital or at home or in care, and for all the health care that they receive in these various places. And for those who have other illnesses, we just bring them and pray that they will know your grace and goodness to them. And most of all, Lord, that not, no one will be neglected during this, this critical time. We're conscious too, Father, that there has been a lot of disruption in society at, at large, but especially in our schools. We pray for teachers and pupils and parents who have had to cope with those disruptions as parents or teachers have had to uh, go home, either because of the virus uh, itself or in order to isolate due to contact. We do give thanks for the news of the vaccine arriving, and we do pray that its, eff its effectiveness will be clinical in restoring confidence, restoring health and confidence. We know that many have been anxious and uh, slow to, to, to move back into any kind of normality, and therefore we pray, Lord, that we will begin to see things moving forward, building new stability as we have this vaccine available. We pray too, Father, for the awareness of your true nature. We thank you, God, that you are there in heaven above. You haven't stopped watching over us. You haven't stopped reigning in heaven. Indeed, Lord, we acknowledge that it is your mighty power that has enabled this vaccine to become available so soon. We thank you for wisdom and guidance given to the scientists and, and all the different uh, research that has had to be done. Lord, we want people to recognize that your hand is in it all and to give you the glory. Father, we pray that you will bless every home and family of our congregation. And we do look forward to meeting face to face in worship next Lord's Day. Until then, Lord, may our hearts be filled and nurtured by the goodness of your word and by your Holy Spirit ministering to us daily in Christ, in whose name we pray. And now we turn to your word and pray that you will open our hearts to hear your word today and bless us from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we, we come to consider God's word again in First Kings chapter 18. As I said earlier, we can't leave Elijah high and dry, literally dry at this point, but we have to um, experience the rain coming. Well, we know what it's like when the rain comes. We've had plenty of it during the last few weeks, but the folks back in Israel at that time had three years with no rain, and uh, Elijah has been told by God the rain will come, and so we, we want to see how it comes. And our title for today is Rain in Abundance. 
as uh, Elijah is able to speak of the rain coming from heaven. After a, a long, dry spell, there is something very refreshing about rainfall. We, we, I know we, we get lots of rain, so we appreciate warm, hot days and all we can do. And back in the spring, early summer, we had a very long spell of dry uh, weather. But of course, the downside of that is that the gardens get dried up and, and the grass is discolored, it goes yellow, and crops are struggling in the fields, and there's a, there's a need for rain. And then sometimes there are restrictions as reservoirs uh, levels go down and, and water is, usage is restricted. And when all of that comes together, we are glad to see the rain. And of course, in many countries, there's, there's an annual looking for the rains to come. In so many of the African countries, there is the dry season that, uh, that uh, dries up the ground and hardens the earth and they cannot grow their crops or crops have been planted and they're depending on the rain for growth. And the rains must come at the right time. If it comes too early, crops might be, seed might be washed away. If it comes too late, the, the, the crop doesn't grow. They are a people who look for the rain clouds gathering and rejoice when the rain comes. Coming back to the Israelites, Ahab and the company gathered at Carmel. It's been three years without rain. That's a long time. And many in Israel have, have suffered severe hardship, loss of their crops, loss of livestock, and no doubt also the loss of life. And King Ahab blamed Elijah the prophet. But Elijah reminded Ahab that it was because of his ungodly ways that God had closed the heavens. The false god Baal had offered no help or relief to Israel in their time of distress. And when Elijah calls the people to Carmel, Elijah there challenged the prophets of Baal to call out to their God to come with consuming fire. But despite their enthused calling, Baal gave them no answer, as we note it last Sunday. But when Elijah called out to God, fire from heaven came down to consume the animal sacrifice, to consume the sticks upon the altar, even consuming the stones and drying up the trench filled with water. People looked on with all. They bowed down in fear, crying out, the Lord is God, the Lord is God. And they took the prophets of Baal, and Elijah's command put them to death, according to the law of God. And as Ahab watched on, he must have feared. These were the prophets that he had introduced to Israel. These were the prophets of Baal that he had set before the people of Israel. And Elijah was the man of God who has ordered their death. And Ahab must have quaked in his shoes thinking, what's he going to do to me? He must have been relieved and much amazed when Elijah turned to him and told him to go and eat for the rain is coming. There are two things that I want to highlight from all of these events that really capture the whole of Elijah's ministry with Ahab to date. First of all, when God holds back. And then secondly, we'll look at when God pours out. When God holds back, when God pours out. First, when God holds back. Or we could give it a, a kind of a sub heading, no rain, no blessing. The reason for Israel's plight was idolatry and spiritual diversity. When Ahab married Jezebel, she brought her Baal worship from Phoenicia to Samaria. She encouraged her husband to get rid of the prophets of, of God and, and set up altars to Baal and appoint those prophets of Baal. 
and destroy the, all, all the, anything that was about the worship of God. And Elijah, the prophet of God, confronts this shameful king, saying there will be no rain for many days in the land. As Elijah invokes God's warning that was given in the days of Moses, that if the people disobeyed, he would shut the heavens and there would be no rain upon the earth. When God holds back, no rain means no blessing. This is the chastening rod upon spiritual adultery of people who had turned away from the God who loved them and redeemed them from their captivity and gave them their land, rejected by the people. God is chastening their adulterous, idolatrous behavior. And it is God not Elijah who turns the rain off. Ahab might have blamed Elijah for the trouble, but Elijah could not stop the rain. Only God. No rain means no blessing. And you know, there are times when God, when God holds back and the church experiences no blessing. Spiritual drought is sent by God to chasten an adulterous, idolatrous people. When we allow God to fade into the unnoticed background of nominal Christianity, when we become cold and dry, even hardened against His discipline, when the church treats God as a concealed deity, almost hidden away, one perhaps to whom we might turn in a time of an emergency. But you know, in spite of us, God is not sitting idle. Israel dared to flirt with idols, and God will not allow His great name and His great power to be trivialized. There are still many who trivialize God. Sadly, there are many who profess to belong to God, but who show meager evidence of love and worship and obedience. Some even abuse His mercy by thinking, even if I sin, God will forgive me. That's the kind of attitude Israel had towards the God and the co Ark of the Covenant. Why we have the Ark of the Covenant? We're okay. We're safe. Do what we like. God warns you will reap what you sow. So God holds back His blessing from those who hold back from loving and obeying Him. And God may well even leave you to wallow in the mess of your sin and your shame in order to teach submission and obedience and holiness. When God holds back, the church will endure dry times be no blessing from heaven. Christians grow cold and dry because they neglect the means of grace that God has provided. The reading of His Word, the prayerfulness of the people, the need for fellowship and worship together. And the church shamefully mirrors the popular patterns of the world and becomes sterile in a decadent society. Elijah challenges the foolish trends of Israel. He is God's voice speaking out in the midst of that decadence then. And the church of Christ today must be that voice that speaks out against decadence in our society and challenge the foolish trends of our world. Christians must stand up for Jesus. The church must set the trend. Set the trends for the world, declaring the rule of God and the glory of His people. When God holds back, there is no blessing. Secondly, when God pours out, or again by way of subheading, showers of blessing. The contest at, at Carmel is, is all about God. Elijah's role as a prophet is primarily to preach and pray. 
And he comes to challenge Ahab and the prophets of Baal with words that are laid upon his heart. And he prays to God. His life is marked out by prayer. And in his prayer at Carmel, Elijah does not pray for fire, even though that is the challenge. But if we look back to verse 36 of chapter 18, Elijah says there, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, appealing to the God of the fathers of Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. In verse 37, he prays, May this people know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Elijah's prayer is that God will make himself known to these people and turn their hearts back to him. God is in heaven, unseen by human eyes, but God is there. And God hears when his people pray. Elijah prayed that there would be no rain. The New Testament reminds us there was no rain for three years. Three and a half years, says James. Elijah prayed at Zarephath, restore life to this boy, and the boy was restored. Elijah prayed on Mount, on Car on Mount Carmel, let it be known that you are God. And God answered with fire. When God pours out, there is great blessing. There is blessing in abundance. So there is hope on Mount Carmel. But there is also tension at Carmel. The people of Israel have bowed down to God, crying out, The Lord, He is God. But Ahab and the prophets have not. And the prophets are put to death. Ahab is spared. And as Ahab eats and refreshes his body, we note there is still no contrition. There's no sense of his sin or his shame, that he has turned a nation away from the worship of God, who has just shown him and declared himself in that fire from heaven. Nor is there even any thankfulness to God or to Elijah for doing this great thing. He merely satisfies himself as he refreshes his body. While he is satisfying himself, Elijah goes up the mountain and there he bowed low in supplication to God. The verses that Caris read for us tell us he bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. It was in real humility that he has come down before God. He's not standing there with any sense of arrogance or pride saying, Lord, you have done this for me and that for me, now send the rain. He is on his knees crying out to God. And as he prayed, he tells his servant, look out to see. Look out to the sea and, and see if what, what, the, what there is to, to see there. But there's nothing there. And six times he tells him, look out to the sea. There is nothing there. Nothing there. You begin to just wonder, is the rain not going to come? Is God's word not going to be fulfilled? And then he said a seventh time, look out to sea. Elijah has confidence that God has said to him, Go to Ahab because I will send the rain. And Ahab, Elijah has not given up on that. And so with faith he says to his servant, Look again. And the servant says, I see a small cloud like the hand of a man rising up from the sea. Just a little cloud. Not a big, dark thunder cloud, 
but a tiny hand-sized cloud rising from the sea. That's enough for Elijah to say to Ahab, get home before the rain. Sometimes we do that, don't we? We're maybe out for a walk or out somewhere and you see the big clouds are gathering and you know there's going to be rain and you say we need to get home quickly before the rain. I remember when I was an assistant in Belfast living in a little housing estate and we had just come in into the house and there was just a little spot of rain had hit the wind, windscreen and I just thought if I rush quickly I can get the grass cut before the rain comes on. There wasn't a lot of grass, but it was, I was able to get it cut just in time. Before the rain comes. And so Ahab rides excitedly back to Jezreel and back to Jezebel, his wife, who knows nothing yet of the, the death of the prophets. And then we have this strange verse, 46 the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he gathered up his garment and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. I I just try to picture what that must have been like. Here's Ahab and his horse and chariot rushing to get back to Jezreel and here comes Elijah running past the chariot, past the horse, running ahead of, of Ahab. Reminds me of some of those films that we sometimes get to see. An amazing picture of action as he runs ahead of the chariot. Opinion differs about why Elijah runs ahead of of, of Ahab. Ralph Davis suggests that by being constantly in the eye of Ahab, he is a reminder to the king that this is the work of God, to draw Ahab back to God to be a a kind of constant reminder, this is God's hand. Matthew Henry, on the other hand, suggests that that by ignoring the prophet, Ahab shows his disdain. He he could have said to Ahab, get on board the chariot with me. You, You needn't tire yourself running. Come with me. He ignores him. D.W. Pink holds that since Ahab's heart was hard as stone, he has no time for Elijah, and Elijah has no message for him. When God holds back, there is no blessing. But when God pours out, there is blessing in abundance. And in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. Rain in abundance. Elijah prayed that God would make himself known at Carmel, and he did. People who had gone after Baal betrayed God, devalued God, loved other things more than God. Now their hearts are broken by God as he turned their hearts back, and they cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And very soon, refreshing showers are sent from heaven. The rain has come. There's a little children's chorus that says, and the prayers go up, the blessings come down. Does all that we read of Elijah not convince us of how valued our praying must be? This courageous man of God looks to God to break through the darkness. Surely also we should pray for new breakthroughs today. Let it be known that you are God. Let the, let the people out in the world there know that you are God. When Elijah prayed that this people may know, he shows that God can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Elijah could not close the heavens could not raise the boy to life, could not send the fire upon the altar, could not open the heavens for rain, but God can. It is God who seals the clouds and there is no rain. It is God who restores life in that little boy's life. It is God who suddenly rips through the sky to show his power and his presence. It is God who sends the rain in abundance. When God pours out, he doesn't hold back. 
The church today must be Elijah calling out to God. Yes, amid the ungodliness of our ungodly world, we need to pray that God will hold back, that people might be brought to a sense of their sin and their shame. But we also need to pray that God will open the windows of heaven and pour down a blessing until there is no more need, as Malachi puts it in chapter 3.10. When God pours out, He pours out in abundance. Elijah prayed and God answered with fire and rain comes from heaven. Fire is a constant reminder of the power of God. Rain speaks of the blessing of God. And on the day of Pentecost, God poured out in abundance His Holy Spirit upon the church as tongues of fire came down upon the gathered believers in Jerusalem. This is his greatest provision. And we need to believe in what God has done already, that God has given his Holy Spirit to every believer in the church, and we need to pray to be filled and empowered with this heavenly fire that we might be enabled to live as true children of God in a dark and danger-filled world. And God pours out. He pours out in abundance. God turns hearts back. God opens eyes to see what He has done in sending His only Son into our world, in not giving Christ to die on the cross for our sin, how He raised to, is raised to glory for our justification. God opens hearts. To believe in his great name. As we close can, today, can, can you see God in the world around you? The heavens declare the glory of God. The whole earth is filled with his handiwork. Can you see God revealed in this wonderful book of Scripture? As God introduces us to himself and to his Son and to his wonderful work of salvation you see God, then bow down before him and say, the Lord, he is God, God of my heart. May God bless his word to our hearts. Let's pray together. Almighty God, our Father, we just want to let your word settle into our hearts and pray that by your Holy Spirit, you will just engage with each one of us as we look at our lives in the light of your greatness, your brightness, your glory. And we see all of our weakness and all of our darkness and all of our futile ways. Help us, Lord, just let your Holy Spirit take control of our lives. Remove all our dark passions. Remove all our sins and transgressions. Put a new spirit within us, O Lord, we pray, that we will worship you truly as God of all, Lord of our hearts, King of glory. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. The closing praise today is a lovely hymn that again just speaks to us of the greatness of God who has given us Jesus Christ, his Son. It's entitled, Jesus, My Living Hope, and reminds us how Jesus has taken our place at the cross but is raised for our glorious salvation. Jesus, my living hope. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb in 
desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of has spoken I am forgiven the King of Kings calls me his own beautiful Savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ my living hope Let's just bow in closing prayer. Father, 
we pray your blessing upon our hearts. Lord, don't hold back, we pray, from pouring out blessings upon us today. We pray that our hearts will be filled with blessings in abundance, that you will open those windows of heaven and pour upon us. May grace and mercy and peace from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit Rest, abide, and be with us all, now and always. Amen. Thank you, and God willing, we'll be able to meet together next Sunday morning. Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire. And the flood, your faith.